Welcome to the Starry Eyed Effect. I'm Brendan. And I'm Jen. On this podcast, we'll be chatting about all things Williams Syndrome. Ups and downs, and what it's like living with Williams Syndrome. We're excited to share our community with you. Thanks for being here. What's up, you two? Oh, I, I'm I'm a little uh, proud of it that uh, that I want to promote the um, this year we have a uh, tw- the 2023 WSA holiday gift guide. Oh um, yeah, that too. Yeah, so uh, and the ornament, and and the, ornament. And, yeah, the ornament um, is uh, is great. It's already on my tree. Um, I ordered it right away and uh, and already got it. it already, wow, received it. that's really um, fast. Yeah, yeah. But the holiday gift guide is just it, all it is is we just wanted to celebrate businesses that um in some ways sometimes officially, sometimes unofficially support uh the WSA, support individuals with Williams syndrome. Um so these are places that hire people with Williams syndrome. Um so we have a big a bit what my the last page of this gift guide is just a thank you and it's just a list of all of these businesses that um you know that hi, hire people with uh, uh currently hire people with Williams syndrome and it's um you know it's it's great it's a an you know it's important to have an inclusive uh, uh work environment um so so thank you to all of those businesses. If you're looking for different uh, holiday gifts at this time of year. Where can people find the holiday gift guide? Uh, yeah. Williams hyphen. You know what? I'll, I'll splash this up on the page for the video. Oh, good. Williams hyphen syndrome dot org slash 2023 hyphen WSA hyphen holiday hyphen gift hyphen guide. All right. Let's go. <laughs> oh man, I regret even bringing that up now because I you know having to say that. Yeah, I cannot believe it's already Christmas time um on holiday gift giving, but I do. I'm a big proponent of um gifts with intention and so like for Stella's entire team and there's a lot of people who touch um, interact with Stella and so I always give them a gift from the disability space bonus points if it is has some sort of Williams syndrome tie I love that um so the guide will be a great tool for years to come uh and there's so many more organizations i'm sure we'll add to the list next year that's that's the hope i already added two businesses to it this morning and so that's the nice thing about it being on our website is i can continuously update it um and thank um thank these places and then and, and we can we can support it's just you know it's it, it's not super it's nothing too special it's just a you know place where we have some links where you can go get some get some Give stuff some ideas for my for my personal shopping um place. so let's let's get into it um i guess so for the for the listener um jen had this uh awesome idea uh, she saw a trailer for this movie called unseen yeah about the caregiver crisis in our in our uh in our country. Uh the website for that is caregiverdoc doc dot uh, com. Um and you can you can rent it right there. And it is a uh it's a documentary. It's only about an hour long about um mostly I mean it's it, but it, it mostly focuses on one family. That's the sort of the, yeah. the lens that um that this is but it has clips yeah. and interviews of many many people who are caregivers of kids with a physical uh developmental intellectual disabilities and and talking about um what it's like uh being essentially a 24 7 caregiver uh mm-hmm. so jen had the idea of let's watch it and let's talk about it and uh, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to have sarah on um because she is not only a caregiver herself but someone who tries to help uh find yeah. programming and and trying to find resources for caregivers so um so that is something um so yeah so we all so we had a little homework assignment mm-hmm. and uh now we get to report back uh and and we haven't talked about we haven't talked about what we think about this documentary the three of us so this is all um 
This is all new to each other. Um, so uh, who wants to start? I, 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 like, let's just talk like general first reactions to the documentary. Hoping my dog won't bark while we're talking. Okay, so um, I actually saw the the documentary. I think one of my friends might have like told me about it first, but then I saw a trailer for it again. And I was like, Oh yeah, I need to circle back and watch that. Um, I didn't realize that it was November is national caregivers month and caregiving has a broad term, right? Like that when we think of traditional caregiving, we think about like caring for our child. Um, that looks a little bit different and a little bit more intense when you are um, caregiving for a child with a disability. Um, caregiving can also be like care caring for um, a parent, an aging parent. It could be caring yeah. for a person with an illness, um, like a terminal type of illness. So I think caregiving takes a lot of different forms. Obviously, we're talking about caregiving for um, disability. Uh, you know, I, I going into the documentary, I had a feeling uh, about what it was going to be about. Um, the The style was interesting. It, it focuses really on like one family. Um, and then it has like some feedback from other caregivers. And you, they don't talk about their um, specific disabilities or conditions. But I think that the themes were pretty strong, right? Which is that um, there is a crisis in caregiving. Uh, many of us see that. And um, I think it's just, I would have loved to have seen us go deeper um, into this, these stories. Um, but I certainly think like just for an hour's worth of time, like they hit on the main points. So I do want to mention, and I think it's important that we mention it here. <clears throat> um, I think a lot of times like our in Williams syndrome, we, we've talked about this before, probably to some degree, we, we say like, oh, our kids are so happy and everything is joyful. Right. And if you're going to have a disability, like, oh, this is the one you should have. Cause it comes with so many great things, but y'all like, there's a lot of hardship that comes with yeah. a disability. Yeah. Um, there's stuff that, that I don't talk about um, you know, like there's stuff that Joel and Jen go through, you know, that they don't talk about. Brendan, I'm sure there's stuff that you don't talk about, um, yeah. with the disability. And it, it's just like, it's, it is hard. It is hard. And I, so I want to take a moment to talk, to, to say to all of you out there listening, um, if you have Williams syndrome or you're caregiving for somebody with Williams syndrome, like I recognize your journey, um, because I'm right there with you. And just because, what you see sometimes is like smiles and rainbows and sunshine. We all know that that's not what it's like every day. Um, yeah. And there's some hard things. There's some hard realities. So I think that the, this film definitely shines a light on some of those hard yeah. things that we don't talk about a lot. Yeah. The struggle is definitely real sometimes, you know, um, you no, know, I always try and put on a strong face you know, always try to, act, you know, make sure that everything is okay, even when it's not, because I don't, I don't want people to know that I'm struggling, you know, um, but one of the things that I learned when I went to the, uh, the Baltimore convention, um, one of the classes about like, uh, sexuality and like mental health and stuff. And one of the things that I learned was like, it's okay to not be okay. Yeah. It's okay to feel how you feel. Your, your feelings are valid. Your feelings matter. You matter. Um, so yeah. Um, how was it, how was it like watching this film, like in the lens of having a disability? It, it It's tough, yeah. you know, it, it was tough um, seeing what those families went through. You know, I have family, you know, deal with that kind of thing. I have a cousin that has really bad uh, cerebral palsy. Um, and so she has to have a lot of care. And um, and I have, you know, friends uh, that are in the caregiving, you know, lane. And I have a friend who is a nurse who was in the caregiving lane. And she saw so many things and heard so many things. Um, so I've seen both sides of the coin. Yeah, it's 
it made me realize like there's a lot more to it than I thought, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it's not as easy as it seems. Yeah, absolutely. Joel, what did you think? Mr. Theater. Major. Mister. From a documentary point of view, uh, you know, it's, it's strongly presented. Um, obviously the subject matter is important to talk about and we don't, you know, we don't talk about it. It, it. The, you know, one of the central themes of it is we do not prioritize caregiving in this country, in our culture. We don't, most Western cultures don't. Um, it would have been nice if they would have talked about why there was one, you know, there was one social worker in there that, that did talk, you know, hinted at it and the, the, uh, history of racism and sexism that goes into the caregiving profession. Um, I would have liked more uh, talking about that, but here's where I had the biggest uh, problem with the documentary. And and I say this with all the respect to this family, this young man, the 16 year old with, um, with hydrocephalus, yeah, hydrocephalus, uh, nonverbal, um, lots of physical uh, uh, disabilities and impairments. He was portrayed like a monster, like a broken person. The o- We never got to see him smile. We never got to see him enjoying the company of his parents or his siblings, of which he had many. How many times did we have to just hear? Nothing else on the screen, but we just heard him um, having a episode or having a tantrum. And it yeah. was like, and, and it was with the, and the music was always this ominous, yeah. uh, you know, kind of low rumbly, intense music anytime he was on the screen. And, and, and I'm just like, and it, and the love that this family has for their son. And I think with the little uh, interjections of the other uh, caregivers that were throughout the piece, there was an element of the, the love for the child is assumed. Mm-hmm. Of course we love our kid. You know, I love our kid. I mean, we're going to do whatever we want for him. However, we are in crisis and, you know, it, it, it really made it feel like those of us who are caregivers, our children are nothing but a burden. And and if you are a person with a disability watching it, you are going to feel like a burden. Uh, I had to really watch very closely to just to un- to and with as much grace as I possibly could, because I'm like, I know they didn't set out to to do this. This isn't what they set out to do, but this is how it is impacting me as a viewer and how it was portrayed yeah well it's interesting because the objectives like i was just reading the website <clears throat> so it said the objective of the film is to give an unfiltered glimpse into the lives of parent caregivers and their challenges to shed light on how difficult it can be to get support and solutions and establish strategic partnerships and enable real change um so, I mean, like, I definitely understand, like, I see what you're saying about, like, the, you know, kind of main family that they were um, highlighting in the film. But I was also like, you know, there's, again, just thinking in the Williams syndrome lens, right? There are some people with Williams syndrome who aren't verbal. There are some, um, you know, like they were talking about this particular individual hit once he started Um, puberty became very aggressive and very hard to um, manage. And I mean, I certainly can understand that like with my own kiddo, right? (laughs) Like, um, and how, how hard that can be um, when, you know, you love, like to me, I'm like, you love somebody so much, but they just have these things that they can't control. Um, So I know it was like a very, I guess, harsh way that they depicted that. But I certainly think like some of it resonated with me, even though like my situation is entirely different. No, I, and I agree. I mean, there, there like, you know, there are some things that, <clears throat> and the topic of it does resonate. I mean, it is, they're absolutely correct in everything they're saying. Yeah. Um, it's, you would have liked to have seen it. Him. Uh, yeah, I, I would have liked to have seen a, a, a greater picture. I, I'm just wondering, like, who is this? Who is this documentary for? Is it for those of us who are caregivers? Or is this movie for people who are not in who do not have 
a child or they don't have any experience um, with being a, a caregiver to someone with a, a complex medical need. Um, as as that one social worker said uh, in, in it, you know, we're all going to be caregivers and we're all going to be someone who is uh, who is being cared for mm -hmm. in our lives. Yes. Uh, we all will be disabled at some period. What I would have liked to see maybe a more of is like perspective of like the other family members and what their view of it is because that maybe would have maybe shined a little more light on what they're feeling and what they're actually going through instead of just having it be like the parents per se you know I mean I, I have a pretty close group of um, parents that um, I'm connected to who all have kids with disabilities <clears throat> and I would say that this like central theme of not feeling like there are resources for caregivers um, is 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 a very large one. Um, and and I was talking about it earlier with Sarah, how you know the WSA we are so fortunate because we do get a lot of um, kind of like forefront and more behind the scenes like resources that aid in our caregiving um, than I think some people with disabilities get or have access to. And um, I think it makes a difference. Like my, my level of burnout and my level of um, advocacy and my level of, I guess, like how I approach Stella's disability is definitely different than some of my friends. And I think some of that is because of the scope of the disability. But I also think it's a, a lot, again, about the resources that I have, right? Because I have resources, um, I don't feel as isolated. I don't feel as ill-prepared. I don't feel that like overwhelming burnout. But like I was saying before, it's but I do feel those things too. Like, so I do want to recognize that there are people, there are people within our community, our Williams Syndrome community, who are gonna watch this film and say, like, I understand that makes sense to me because that is the life I'm living. Um, and and so I what I think was really interesting is. It touched on the lack of resources. It touched on the mental health piece. And I'm just going to tell you guys right now, like it doesn't matter all the resources that you have in the world. Like I have some, I have some PTSD. <laughs> I have some, I have some, some mental stuff that has come from parenting a person with a disability. Like there is no denying that. And so like the fact that they were talking about how, you know, we're so good at diet, Good, it's maybe not the right word, but we like we diagnose or we have intervention strategies for people who come back from war, vets that come back from war to see like where their mental health is. We have some services for them. We have moms that have postpartum depression, right? Like we have services for that. But like what happens when your kid gets diagnosed with a disability? We just throw you out there. We just throw you out there. Mm -hmm. And like then we wonder why there's this burnout and why parents feel like this and they have to make a documentary about this, right? It's because like, yeah. we're all feeling some of the mental effects. Again, like our children are great. I love Stella. I'm not saying like Stella's not great. She has a lot of great things, but she has a lot of hard things too. And those can make it hard to live in, in daily life. Yeah. Um, so I think the mental health theme really resonated with me that, you know, like what would it be like to create more, services around mental health for parents of yeah. individuals with disabilities the the one the the there was a a, a woman in the little uh, other caregivers um snippets testimonials like, yeah, the yeah, testimonials. The, yeah yeah little testimonials um and she said i have you know she said something like i have 30 hours of respite care built into into the programming but when when am i going to take them yeah there's no workers to cover my respite care so yeah. I, I i great you give me you've given me respite care awesome i can't take it yeah because when when am i going to be able to take it and who is going and and this is something that they i i did think that they effectively talked about uh in, in this um is you know it's like 
you know, you have to take care of yourself and, you know, you, we all, we've all gotten it. And I'm sure Brendan, you as an individual with Williams syndrome have gotten it. And I'm sure your folks have gotten it. Oh, you just got to find time to take care of yourself. Sarah touched on it uh, in, in the interview too. Oh, it's got to find time. How? Because life doesn't stop. Yeah. Life doesn't stop so that I can take my respite time. Well, again, people don't understand. Right. And I think they might've mentioned it in the documentary, like very briefly. Right. But when there is like policy coming out about caregiving, um, it's really important that, you know, whether or not you're caregiving presently, that you understand the implications of those, because, um, we all are in this caregiving position, some of us longer than others. Um, Mm -hmm. and, it's really important that we support, um, like you just were saying, Joel, like caregiving as a an industry, right? That it's um, not something that somebody should be shamed into or forced into, or that, you know, we can't, but right now we're in a caregiver crisis where, I mean, and caregivers could be like, even at my daughter's school, paras, right? Like yeah. there's not enough paras to support the individuals with disabilities. Um, so I think like paras lump into that, right? And um, how how do we create the resources that we so desperately need? Because it doesn't matter if you're disabled or if you're aging, right? Like those services are needed. And how do you make sure that they're handled by, um, how to make sure they're staffed, how to make sure they're handled by um, people who are valued for their job, how do you make sure that you're attracting um, and keeping like a pipeline of, of, you know, good candidates? That That is a real struggle. And, and again, I would have loved to see us like go deeper into that in this documentary. Um, but I understand that they, you know, obviously mm-hmm. that might be like a, a, a documentary too. But I think there was a lot like in the surface, it's like, here's kind of this, here's the surface struggle um and now there's a lot of questions that are unanswered right there's areas that i would like to see go deeper yeah absolutely i appreciated that the uh that the dad's perspective was uh accounted for i mean they they even talk that the and and, and like you said jennifer most of the time um this this caregiving space is um, a feminine space. It is uh, in within the family unit. It largely falls on the on the mother, and and how it affects work, how it affects um, relationships with their other kids and stuff. I I did appreciate that that was that was touched upon. Um, it uh, <laughs> I did also appreciate when the mother was like, "I'm 43 and everything hurts all the time. Everything mm-hmm. aches." And I'm like, I'm like, oh, I hear you. I hear you, sister yeah. friend. I'd love to hear what the community thinks. I definitely think it's a good, um, you know, if you're going to spend an hour, like it's a good um, piece to watch. And, you know, I'd love to hear the community's feedback on it. Again, like the story isn't a Williams syndrome story, but I think there's some things that could resonate um, within our community. And like we said, it's National Caregiving Month. Um, we do want to recognize all the caregivers in our community that, um, make it possible for our people to live like such um, fulfilling, enriched lives. And uh, thank you to the Williams Syndrome Association because without you guys, I wouldn't get half of the the rest that I do. Yeah. If you guys watch the documentary, definitely sound off in the comments below. And I think we should put a link to it. Yeah. Too, so yeah. Well, I'll watch. say it again in here: caregiverdoc.com. Um, it's only ten dollars to rent. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, yes, I have a lot of criticisms, but I, I still would say see it, it, it because it is an important conversation. It's not a perfect documentary, but it is a good way to spark a very important discussion. We as a, a country are finally prioritizing diversity, uh, inclusivity and equity, um, starting to prioritize it uh, very slowly. But um, we have to remember that it, without including disability and that includes physical and intellectual and developmental it's not diverse enough yeah absolutely well said hi sarah how are you i'm great how are you doing well well uh for those who don't know who you are uh why don't you tell everyone who you are and what 
you do for, for the ones in your what you're all about. Sure. Um, Hey, everybody. I'm Sarah Giddings, and I'm the Vice President of Programs and Services for the Williams Syndrome Association. Um, what that means is I help ensure that everything that uh, we have going on program-wise, uh, outreach-wise, support that we provide to all of our families uh, keeps going all the time. And so uh, it's it's a lot of things and it's it's really exciting. Um, I have been involved with the Williams Syndrome Association for about 18 years. I have a 21 year old son uh, named Matthew who has Williams Syndrome and I started volunteering when he was pretty young. There was a need in uh, Arizona where I was living at the time for some volunteers got involved that way and um, never looked back. So volunteered, held lots of fundraisers, did some super fun stuff like softball tournaments and a concert one time, lots of walks, and then um, served on the board uh, for a number of years and then joined the staff about three-ish for almost four years ago. Um, Part-time at first, and now I'm uh, in this role. It's kind of evolved personally wise. Uh, I have, I have two of my own boys, uh, Matthew, I mentioned is 21. I also have Connor who is 11 this week and I have some bonus kids. I have a 22 year old bonus daughter and a 21 year old bonus son. Um, they live in Arizona. I live in Florida now. That's the quick summary. Not really quick. That was perfectly quick. Um, yes. so you're like, I keep everything going all the time. Like yep. you do, you do so much for the WSA and your role is, is really critically important. I, you probably, we can't state it enough, like how much you do. Um, maybe you just talk to us about like what it is that you're working on right now and sure. just in general, I mean, I know you're working on convention. Yes. But aside from convention, like sure. day to day, kind of what are your general, um, what are all the balls in the air that keep going? Okay, up? awesome. And convention is a huge one. We literally just yeah. got off the phone with the hotel in Phoenix. Okay. So our registration launch dates or for our hotel room block launch date. So watch for that soon. Uh, so right. that's a huge part. Um Camp is another piece. So our summer camps uh, is in my realm of responsibility and Though that's one week during the summer, it takes a full year to plan. So we're already discussing that for next year. And we're talking about some potential exciting changes in the in the future for camps. Um, maybe being able to include more people, families, maybe. Um, we're we're looking at some exciting ideas there. Um the family support network is a big part of what we do. So uh, those volunteers that are out there supporting families, uh, Joel is the master of all things when it comes to family support. And so he's uh, definitely my partner in crime there to make sure that happens. So our support groups that are out there, if you haven't joined any, they're, they're, they're really incredible. Um, Super important. Yes. And then um, the programs that we have for our adults with Williams Syndrome. So Adventure Seekers is another big piece. Uh, we just did a big trip in uh, Orlando at the end of September for our Adventure Seekers. We had 350 people join us down there in Orlando. We took over a hotel as we always do. That was great. Um, we're working on planning the next trip for that. Um, now we have a call right after this actually on that. So stay tuned. And um, we have those monthly calls as well. So we've got that Adventure Seeker programming for adults with Williams Syndrome uh, twice a month as well, where we where we have that content. I also lead the uh, communications team. So the newsletters that go out, social media, um, all of that communication that you see, so you all know what's going on in the organization. That's uh, one of the things that we work on too. So Giving Tuesday is tomorrow. There's an exciting My Cause, My Cleats thing happening with the NFL this week. Uh, we have our annual appeal coming up later uh, next month. The Board of Trustees uh, annual, um, oh, I was in my brain, uh, the Board of Trustees elections every year. That'll go out soon. Um, so all of those things are kind of hot topics. There's always something. There's not a there's not a slow moment in, in our world. Right. Yeah. Do you want to touch on um, the couple of things that you mentioned that are happening this week, the Giving Tuesday 
I was thinking it'd be an opportunity for you to talk about that from your perspective, both as an employee, but you're also um, a member of the WSA, right? Because your son has Williams syndrome. But let's talk about Giving Tuesday. Like what, what off the cuff, like as a mom and as an employee, like what would you say to those who are considering the WSA as part of their donation strategy? You know, especially on Giving Tuesday, it's such it's such a quick and easy way to contribute to an organization that's important to you. Um, social media is the most powerful way really to give on Giving Tuesday. Facebook, for example, makes it really easy to be able to go on and make a donation. Um, and it's a great day for all of us as members to be able to share with our, you know, our followers, our community out there on social media, how important it is uh, to give to our organization. So we'll make it easy tomorrow. There will be po- some posts that we have out there that you can share that make it really easy to give. And just um, just for for us, we're in this incredible time of growth and change and looking at all the different things that we can do out there to support our our families and most importantly, our individuals with Williams syndrome. And um, all of that takes funding and all of it takes resources. We are not government funded. We are all, we're funded solely by private donation. And so every time I make a post, I say that every dollar matters because every dollar seriously does matter. So anything anybody can give is uh, incredibly crucial to us continuing to, to, to do all the important things that we need to do. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I always say the same thing, which is that we're not funded, um, you know, governmentally or federally. And so all of those dollars that we work for really are important. And they all go back to benefiting the individuals and families who are living with Williams syndrome. Um, we're this episode, we're kind of focusing on um, caregiving, right? Because it's National Caregiving Month. And it's interesting as <clears throat> there's another part of the episode where we're talking about this documentary that we all watched, but um, just personally, it made me think a lot about my, um, I guess the work the activities that we partake in as part of the Williams Syndrome Association. And really like when we think of caregiving, right? We think of like respite, right? Like caregivers need a break. And that is true. Um, and I do think that some of the programming that the WSA offers um, is uh, beneficial for that. But I think the education that the Williams Syndrome Association offers to caregivers, you know, that enables me to be a better parent and advocate for my child um, the programming that we can partake in like convention and camps, like it's a way for me to connect with other people that are walking a similar journey. And really without the Williams Syndrome Association, like those things may be happening, but they would not be happening on the scale, at least for our family, <laughs> um, they do presently. So I think Giving Tuesday is a tremendous opportunity for us to honor the work that you guys all do because it it is, it's hard work. And like we were talking about, you have a son with Williams syndrome. Do you want to talk about how you balance that? Cause that's a lot. You have a lot on your plate with the WSA and then you have a lot on your plate at home. It's so interesting because I, I started thinking about this a little bit once uh, when Joel asked me to join and I feel like um, I'm doing a lousy job right now. And I would bet the majority of caregivers listening would probably say the same thing right now because it's a lot and, and life's a lot. And, and we're all, um, it's the, it's sounds cliche, but we're all, you know, we're all fighting battles. No one knows about behind the scenes. And so when you add in the, the caregiver piece of it, it's, it's a lot. So one of my hesitations, even in taking this role was not being sure if I could juggle those two things with, with it being William syndrome and supporting families all day long. And then do I have do I have something left at the end of the day or during the day or whenever I, whenever, whenever I need it to support him um, working remotely adds that, that challenge in there too. Um, Cause if he's not out doing things, he's literally in the wall right there and hears everything and chimes in and wants to be part of it. Um, so it's, it's a, it's kind of a 24 seven thing. And, um, and then, you know, to make things more challenging, I, I don't have any neurotypical children in my <laughs> world. So we got some ADHD. There's some pretty serious mental health issues out there too, autism. Uh, so you you learn to juggle a, a little bit, but I, 
I feel like for me, I am, I'm doing a lousy job right now. Um, one of the things that I did in my life a couple of years ago was really, and it was pandemic and quarantine that made me really look at this was, um, you know, am I where I want to be physically? So I lived in Arizona. Um, I moved out there for a very specific reason, you know, about 26 years ago. And um, it wasn't my favorite place to be. I love Arizona. Convention is going to be fabulous in Arizona. But I grew up in Florida. I grew up near the water, which is very peaceful and grounding for me. I grew up going to Disney, which I have a huge love for. And I always in the back of my head thought my kids would love that. My kids would love having those things too. And spending that time at home 24 seven with everyone um, watching Matthew's anxiety increase, watching, you know, my youngest struggle because he wasn't in school made me really think about, you know, what, what do I have control over? What can I do? Um, I can't leave this <laughs> place right now. And, you know, the tub with bubbles only works so much. Um, and so I made a conscious decision to say, I want to be back in a place that brings me peace. And so luckily the housing market did exactly what I needed it to do. And so we were able to sell out there and move, move back to Florida. So I've been here um, a little over a year and uh, I go, I go to the beach as often as I can by myself. Um, I do it early Sunday mornings. Often um, I go for sunrise and sit and just find some peace, do a little meditating and spending some quiet time on my own. I've done some super cool drum circles at, at sunset uh, for full moons, which has been super interesting and super fun people watching. If you've never <laughs> done that before, the one right before Halloween was super awesome. And, um, and we've spent a lot of time at Disney. We got passes right away and we're fortunate enough to be able to, you know, to ha have that luxury. Um, I'm, aware of how, how great that is. Um, but at the same time, moving states is a lot. Uh, we moved from a state where in Arizona benefits were fairly easy. Once you figured out the system, uh, fairly easy to get, and there's no waiting list out there. So HAB and respite and, um, attendant care, all those things that, that you may need to provide parental support. It's, it's there and easy to access. That is not the case here in this state. Um, there's a huge wait list. Um, I'm still figuring out Medicaid, <laughs> for example. I mean, I work in this and part of it is because I only have so many hours in a day. So I'm feeling a little bit like I'm slower at doing the things that I want to be doing um, just because of everything that I have on my plate, but still trying to figure that out. Um, working on this transferring guardianship. You can't transfer into Florida. So I have a virtual hearing next week in Arizona to get that one um terminated and get the one in Florida going. So even just if life was moving at a regular pace, there's all these extra things that in trying to find some peace, I've added into that caregiver um, plate to that, that I have to manage as well. So this is a lot of rambling and I don't know if it got you what you wanted, but I've had to slow and be intentional about saying, I'll be caring for him in one way or another, maybe not in my home, because my goal is eventually to find him somewhere to be, yeah. um, but not for another probably 10 years down the road, but I'll be caring for him the rest of my life. So uh, hopefully, well, actually that's a different discussion. I hope I, I hope I outlive him so he doesn't have to go through that, but that's a different discussion. Um, you should have uh, watched this documentary girl. Oh, oh man. man. Well, now that I know about it, I will. So, um, it, it's, uh, I have a lot of years ahead, hopefully caring for him and, uh, I have to be intentional about it. Um, and so I made a huge move, literally a huge move to, to help make that, um, happen. But still on my list is I need to start practicing yoga and I need to do, I need to eat better and I need to do all these things and, um, I just have to make them. Yeah. And they're, and they're hard when, when you're busy. Uh -huh. Um, the documentary also talked a lot about, um, how hard it is when you have a person with a disability to have basically like a traditional job. And I like, so resonate with that because, mm -hmm. um, a lot of times the burden does come down to no offense to all of it. It comes down to the mom usually to like be the caregiver 
usually, and um, it really influences how you're able to serve your community and yourself if you have, you know, career goals and or serve your your child. Um, and then, like you said, squeeze in a little bit of time for yourself, like yeah. self-care. There's no time for self-care. I'm yeah, sure. I know. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think strategizing a move and getting into a location, at least that brings you peace is the, is the first step. And that's the nice thing that, that, that all the Williams syndrome employees work remotely. Yes. Right. Um, and so I think that that does help with the flexibility and being able to manage needs. How has that transition been for Matthew to move from Arizona to Florida? You know, it's been, um, it's been challenging. Like I've watched his anxiety amp up and it's, it's so hard to tell. Is it like, because of the circumstances is it because just he's aging and that's going to maybe happen naturally for him. He also has an autism dual diagnosis. So, you know, that adds in that extra layer of complexity, but he had, I mean, he had a village in Arizona. It, we lived in the same small town, small-ish town uh, since he was little and he grew up going to school there Everybody knew him, you know, like a lot of other people I've heard with Williams syndrome, like he, people called him the mayor of the school and he invited the mayor to his graduation and the mayor came and like, he knew everyone. He had this incredible village. And that was one of the biggest hesitations for me to make that move is knowing that what I was doing wasn't 100% selfish. I knew that he would get here and love it too. I also had confidence that he would get here and find a new village. And so um, it's been slow because, you, you know, you move and I built a home. So mm -hmm. had to like rent and then move again and then get established in that house. And then my mom who uh, helps out with Matthew also moved. And so she got her own house. She was getting established. Okay. It took a little while for us to get, uh, to get ramped up, but um, he just connects well with people. It, it works out beautifully. I will all the time. I'm like, I'm cause I'm a like a painful introvert. And so it's, it's great for me because I don't have to worry about being that person ha that has to like start the first conversation when, I'm out with Matthew because he'll do it for me, but he's got, you know, he's got his friend, Mr. Mike that works at Walmart that he goes and visits every Wednesday. And now he knows his sister and he's got thrift shops that he makes rounds through. And so there's one in particular who he's really um, attached himself to, and they've been incredible with him. And it's a, it's a thrift shop locally that um, helps funds a little living community for, um, I, be, I believe it's people who have been like displaced from their homes. So I don't know that it's necessarily a foster situation, but people who need this living situation. And so for me, that that's a perfect place for, you know, him to be spending some time. He, um, if he, if he was here right now, he'd be freaking out to tell you this, but he approached them about volunteering with them. And, um, he went back in to follow up a couple of weeks ago and they offered him a volunteer job. So he's thrilled. Now he got offered his first volunteer gig and he starts on Thursday and he starts for an hour and he gets a name tag and we had to buy shirts and all the things. So he's, he's recreating his community. So it's a pretty great thing. We had some family friends that were already here. So that was helpful, like gave us a little bit of a head start. Um, but it is restarting like with so many, so many things. Luckily he, he loves making new friends. So it's the perfect world for him. Oh, I get to see a new doctor. Fantastic. It's new friends. Um, so that part's been, been easy for him. Yeah. That part has been good. Oh, that's good. Cause I, I mean, I know even for our, myself, I always have a hard time envisioning like what that, if we were ever to leave this community that we've built here, like how scary does it feel to go out and, you know, immerse Stella in a new area where she doesn't know anybody. Yeah. Um, she's not quite as social. So yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the hard part, but, um, yeah. but I think it's, it's possible. Right. And especially sure. if they're around things and people that they love. Um, and, and I remember Matthew telling me, at when he was at Venture Seekers that he was going to volu start volunteering. So I'm excited to hear, but yep. he did it so proud of you yeah. if you're watching this, listening to it. That's very, very fun news. Um, yeah, awesome. so do you, do you think that that 
I mean, melding these two worlds together, being a, a mom and a caregiver to people with some some challenges or disabilities, um, and then working in this community, do you feel like that has been good? Um, is there a lot of synergies there, or is it challenging? Because you were mentioning that it is challenging, right? Um, on the like your your mental load in terms of like feeling like you have so much that you're not giving to, but like, but what about the fulfillment side? Cause I bet yeah. there's a lot of fulfillment. I mean, it's definitely a mix of both for sure. Okay. It, it is, it is, it is a heavy load. And sometimes, you know, you're the one that hears the really hard stories or that we just, I'll speak for, for Joel too, in that we just can't do enough fast enough for everyone. And so this feeling of like, just for me, and I'm super hard on myself too, like just that, that we're not enough and that what we're doing is inadequate is very challenging to, to deal with day in and day out. But, um, on the flip side, the fulfillment part is pretty incredible. I, uh, you know, my, my career path has taken me in a couple different directions. I have, you know, I have 10 years of, uh, instructional design and, uh, instruction, like, uh, facilitation for adults. Um, and, and then, um, a couple of years in marketing, a couple of years in communications, and then leading a team that did events and communications and marketing and recognition for some companies. So I feel like all my paths over the past 20 years have kind of led me here because every skill set that I've gained, um, in my professional career, I'm using every single day here. And, um, whether it's, you know, you know, leading this, the incredible team that we have at the WSA or out interacting with everybody or helping plan these events. It's incredibly fulfilling to me, um, to see that I get to make an impact every day. That's always been something that's important to me. I, you know, I wanted to teach people because it bettered themselves. And I wanted to, you know, teach others how to like have their businesses because it, it changed their lives. And so this is, this is directly impactful to a community that I'm incredibly passionate about. And so being able to see uh, the difference that it makes and the impact that we make is, uh, is incredibly fulfilling. And I, I feel like as challenging as it is, and some of the days are incredibly challenging. Um, it's, it's the most fulfilling work I've done for sure. You are, like I mentioned, you are so instrumental, um, for all of the programming that's created for the WSA. So thank you. I know you said it's hard because you feel like you're never doing a great job, but we think you're doing a great job. We appreciate you. Um, and just a reminder to everybody, like Giving Tuesday happening, please make sure that you um, think about the WSA and your gift giving plans. And um, now you have a face, another face with the, with mm -hmm. the name of, of all of this work. Um, and so we appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, awesome. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to The Starry-Eyed Effect, presented by the Williams Syndrome Association. The show is hosted by Jennifer Keaton and Brendan Lemieux, and produced by me, Joel Listman. Theme song by Tommy Barbarella and Mariella Elm. Got a question for the show? Email us at podcast at williams-syndrome.org. Video version of the podcast available on the Williams Syndrome channel on YouTube. Review us on Apple Podcasts, and maybe it will get featured on a future episode. Make sure to like and subscribe to The Starry-Eyed Effect wherever you get your podcast delights. Yeah.